Welcome to today's webinar, Pedestrian Safety, Trends, Measures, and Solutions, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning in coordination with the Maryland Department of Transportation and our many Walk Walktober partners. My name is Michael Bayer. I'm the Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning and host of the Walktober Walk in Our series. Walking is an activity that many of us take for granted, but as pedestrian accident rates continue to rise and access to safe pedestrian spaces is diminished, communities are recognizing that walking and improving the walkability of our neighborhoods requires public attention and action. Throughout October, the Maryland Department of Transportation, in coordination with several state agencies and other partners, is sponsoring a series of webinars or walk in ours to highlight how we can collectively rally around walking, an activity that is both central to the state's active transportation efforts and a critical component of promoting public well being. This is, is the third in a four part series that we are hosting every Thursday this month. Thank you for joining us today. For more information about Walktober, please visit m.maryland.gov forward slash Walktober or visit smartgrowth.org and click on the Walktober Walk in Ours link. We will be adding more information to this Walk in Our page throughout the month as we continue the series. We are recording this webinar and will be posting it online. All participants today will receive an email with a link to the recording once it is posted. The Maryland Department of Planning also hosts a national webinar series in association with the Smart Growth Network on smart growth and planning topics available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. We encourage you to visit the website and to subscribe to our e-newsletter for smart growth and planning news and to learn about our upcoming webinars. You can also find out about planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. The views expressed in this webinar are those of the speakers and not necessarily of the Maryland Department of Planning, the Maryland Department of Transportation, or the State of Maryland. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association. To log your AICP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account, and search for the name of today's event, which is Pedestrian Safety, Trends, Measures, and Solutions. You can also search for event number 9224265. So to get started, our speakers today are Angie Schmidt, Candice Holford, Tom Morehouse, and Eli Glazier. Angie Schmidt is one of the country's best known writers on the topic of sustainable transportation. She was the longtime national editor at Streets Blog. Her writing and commentary have appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, and NPR. She is the founder of a new firm, CMPH Planning and Consulting, a small Cleveland based firm which is focused on pedestrian safety. Her book, Right of Way Race, Class, and the Silent Epidemic of Pedestrian Deaths in America, was published in August by Island Press. Candice Holford is an urban planner who began her career at MDOT SHA in 2017. As the regional planner for Montgomery and Frederick Counties, Candice serves primarily in the Office of Planning and Preliminary Engineering's Regional and Intermodal Planning Division as the MDOT SHA liaison to the Northern Washington DC capital region, local governments, including municipal, county, and regional jurisdictions, as well as to other governmental agencies business, civic, and community organizations, elected officials, and the general public. Candice is also leading the context-driven team in the, and in planning and implementation efforts to deliver MDOT SHA's first pedestrian safety action plan, which focuses on safety for all users. Sergeant, Sergeant Thomas Morehouse is a traffic training supervisor in the training section of the Baltimore County Police Department. He has been an instructor with the department's traffic training team since 20. 2002. He is a crash reconstructionist and a certified instructor in all the department's traffic training courses. In his current position, Sergeant Morehouse manages the full-time and adjunct instructors of the traffic training team, which conducts more than 30 classes per year and trains about a thousand police officers from agencies all over Maryland and the Mid-Atlantic. And finally, Eli Glazier is a multimodal transportation planner in the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. In that role, he serves as the project manager for Montgomery County's first pedestrian master plan. In addition to master planning, Eli reviews regulatory projects for compliance with master plans and multimodal transportation best practices. Before working at MNC PPC, Eli spent several years as a transportation planner with the Tool Design Group, traveling across the country, helping communities become better places to walk and to bike. 
Following their presentations, our panelists will answer as many questions as time permits. You can always submit a question anytime by using the questions tool located on the right side of your screen. And before we get started with the presentation, we're going to have another brief video from MDOT Secretary Greg Slater, who is going to introduce today's Walktober Walk in Our program. Great, thank you, uh, Greg. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Angie Schmidt to begin our presentations today. Welcome, Angie. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, can everyone see that? Okay. Yes, you're good. Great. Um, so I think my role here is to sort of bring you the bad news. Um, I had a, I have a book out um, last year, and it's called Right of Way. And when I explain it to people, sort of my elevator pitch is it's about the pedestrian safety crisis. That's what I call it in the United States. And I'm going to try to explain a little bit about why that's happening um, and then briefly what we can do about it and sort of what's prevented us from making progress on this in the past, in the recent past. OK, so the, when I talk about the um, pedestrian safety crisis, this is this is what I mean. Um, we've had about a 50% increase in pedestrian deaths in the last 10 years. And this, um, this is really unusual in traffic safety. We used to be able to sort of expect that outcomes would improve over time. So when this first started occurring, a lot of people were really um, confused about what was happening, thought maybe it was a fluke, but we now know that it's this sustained trend. And, um, you know, my book was actually published last um, summer it was sort of in the height of the coronavirus pandemic and i sort of worried you know how relevant is this book going to be but it turns out uh the problem only got worse in the last year so we saw even worse outcomes even with a lot less people commuting to work during the coronavirus pandemic and um some of the racial disparities that i'm going to discuss got worse so I want to talk first about a little bit about who is getting killed because this problem, um, my explanation for the problem is it has to do with a few different trends that are happening across the United States. Um, so some of them are demographic trends. And um, so I think, you know, one of the stereotypes when we're thinking about this issue, um, some sort of media tropes is um, I think when people think about who's getting killed, they think sort of of this guy here on the left. Um, in their minds and they think, you know, he's sort of a, this is the kind of person getting killed, a very wired millennial and they're in a crosswalk and they're in a major city, maybe like DC. And um, I think that that's really a misunderstanding. And I think it goes back a little bit to the sort of the privilege of a lot of the people that are in positions of authority on this issue, whether they're in the media or in government. So I think this guy here on the left is sort of what they're seeing anecdotally on their drive to work. But the reality is the kind of people getting killed are much more like this guy here on the right that's just kind of sprinting across a suburban arterial road that in this case doesn't even have a crosswalk. 
And I think a lot of people, again, in positions of authority, just are not being put in this position, you know, they live in a neighborhood that has better facilities or they have a car and they can avoid these kind of situations. So they're not very sympathetic to the people that are. And I think that's part of the problem. So this, this issue is a lot like Corona. And I think the way we're starting to understand all of our health problems being um, related to a lot of this inequality, systemic racism we see in our society. So the the burden, this is a Smart Growth America chart that they produced, is not shared equally. And um, it has, and people of color are at heightened risk. Um, particularly native people are about twice as likely to be killed. Black people and Hispanic people to a certain degree are also at increased risk. And I'm gonna talk more later in the presentation about why that is. But one thing I do want to say is pretty much um, everyone from uh, an identity that's a little bit marginalized or oppressed are at heightened risk to be killed this way. And these are not disparate groups. A lot of people have maybe overlapping identities, so their risk may even be heightened. But another group that we need to be concerned with when we're talking about this is older folks. So um, the risk to be killed this way starts rising when people are as young as 50. And um, by the time they're 75 or older, they're you know, more than 50% as likely to be killed. So I'm not gonna dwell on this too long, but one, a couple things I did wanna say here, this is a very fast grow, growing demographic in the United States. So um, about one in four Americans almost are 65 and older now. And that is expected to grow pretty rapidly in the next few decades. We're gonna get up to almost one in three. So what that means practically speaking is we have more people that are just have this, a little bit more vulnerability to this problem um, out there in our society. And I, I also wanna add that this is not a group we've done a very good job planning for. You know, they're, they're not sort of centered a lot of times in our planning decisions. Okay, so that's a little bit about who is getting killed. And I want to talk about where. Um, and I, I want to talk about some trends that are happening at the metro level. This is across the United States, but in this um, graphic, I'm using suburban as Atlanta as an example. And this is a this is a racial dot map, and it, it shows racial segregation in suburban Atlanta in 1990. So orange areas are segregated white areas green, very green areas or segregated black areas, and then the yellow areas show places that are a little more diverse. So I just want to I just want to point out what happens over the next two decades in these regions. So the, each of the counties north of Atlanta have about a million people, and they were originally sort of uh, settled in kind of the 60s white flight era when it, the expectation was everyone would have sort of two cars in the garage, there wouldn't be a lot of walking happening. But there's been a very, very dramatic demographic change in those two counties. And now um, bo both of them are either majority minority, um, which is sort of a misnomer, obviously, or um, close to it. Um, and, and there has been, um, and, and the road system has not been adapted. <laughs> Um, not only are we seeing more diversity in our suburbs, we're also seeing more economic diversity. We talk about this phenomenon of um, the suburbanization of poverty. That means more people who may rely on walking or rely on the bus are out in locations that really weren't planned with their needs in mind. Um, and in this map, you can see this, this um, purple area there's um, the most dangerous road, one of the most dangerous roads in Georgia, uh, a road called Buford Highway, goes right sort of through these northern counties and um, right through these, uh, these areas that are real hot spots for new immigrants who move into the region. So these are folks that um, are coming from countries, in most cases, that have much lower car ownership, have much more of a culture around walking, and they're being put in very dangerous situations arriving in these suburban counties. So here's an example. This is also from Atlanta. This is one of the southern counties, but you, this, is, this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. This was, you know, originally a rural sort of 
highway. And now um, the growth, the suburban growth from Metro Atlanta has just overwhelmed it. And you see this woman sitting um, at this bus stop. So people are having to navigate this road to meet their needs and that's just not safe. Okay, so um, I, I also wanna talk about, so we, so people are getting older and are, there are a little more vulnerable and they're also increasingly living in places that are a little bit more dangerous potentially. And that could have to do with gentrification as well. Um, but more people sort of out in suburban areas that are a little more dangerous. And also we have more people living in the Sunbelt region of the United States, which is the most dangerous for pedestrians um, for a variety of reasons. So. We also have, we also see disparities sort of within our cities. I want to use Cleveland where I live sort of as an example here. Again, this is a racial dot map. You can see sort of what our segregation patterns are there. Now, if you compare that to our most dangerous road segments, you can see that they overlap with neighborhoods of color almost exactly. Um, and that's something we see in places across the United States. Again, uh, here I'm, I'm gonna use Portland as an example. So um, the Portland Bureau of Transportation to their credit produced this really nice map here on the left that shows all the traffic fatalities that occurred in 2017 and 2018. And they use the names of the victims, first names they're trying to you know, humanize these folks and um, get people to sympathize with the problem. But one thing I want to point out about this is you can see how they're not happening in sort of a random pattern. There's this clear concentration over here on the right side of the map. So if we look over at what's going on there. So um, in Portland, there is a there is a big demographic fault line right here at East 82nd Street. I think all our cities have roads or dividing lines like this. Um, but the important thing to know about Portland is that everyone, everything east of 82nd Street here is East Portland. And East Portland is lower income and more diverse than the rest of the city. So here they mapped the 30 high, the 30 top high crash intersections in the city of Portland. And um, 28 out of 30 are in East Portland. So there is um, some infrastructure inequality. There is some discrimination against neighborhoods. And a lot of times these are the neighborhoods that need these facilities the most. So um, in Portland, about only about a quarter of the population of the city lives in East Portland, but um, they account for 50% of the traffic deaths there. So people that live in that part of the city are twice as likely to be killed. And again, I'm using Portland, Cleveland as an example, but those are national trends. So we see that, we see that everywhere. Okay, so finally, um, you know, we have a trend, Americans are getting older, Americans are living in more dangerous places potentially. And then thirdly, um, we have a big shift in what's going on with vehicles in the United States. So this starts happening after we come out of the last recession where, um, if you look back to about 2010, about three quarters of new vehicles being sold in the United States were sedans. They were, you know, regular cars like a Honda Civic or a Camry. Um, but we see this big, big shift um, in the later part of the decade. And now if you look at the most recent year for new car sales, almost we see the exact reverse. Almost three quarters are pickup trucks or SUVs. So um, cars are getting bigger that ends up having a really big impact on pedestrian safety. So you can see here, um, I'm using myself for scale. I'm a, I'm a woman, I'm like a, a little bit of tall woman, average tall, um, five, six. So you can see if I was hit by a sedan, this is a Honda Civic, it's sort of a small car here on the left, it would hit me sort of like in the legs, right? Which is not, it's not good to get hit by a car anywhere. But um, if, if you look over here, this is a Toyota 4Runner. Um, you see this, this vehicle would hit me sort of in the chest and the abdomen. That's a more, much more dangerous place to suffer uh, a severe injury. So um, there we have very strong data now showing that, um, that, for example, the Federal Highway Administration released a report in 2015 showing pedestrians who were struck by SUVs were two and a half to three times more likely to be killed than those struck with sedans. 
We also see this recent trend um, where pickup trucks have become really enormous with really aggressive front ends. Um, this is just a photo I used to dramatize it. That's my son when he was four years old that's standing in front of, that's a lifted Ford F-250. So the, these cars not only are huge, they have big forward and rear blind zones. As many, there's people that have done experiments that show as many as like 26 children can sit in the blind zone of some uh, full-size SUVs and be totally invisible to the driver. Uh, I'm not gonna, uh, sorry to go down such a rabbit hole about cars, but I think like as planners, we need to be more conscious of what's happening in the auto industry because it, it really affects our ability to keep people safe. And so this is another trend I just wanted to touch on briefly. So not only have cars gotten bigger, they've also gotten a lot more powerful in recent years. They call this the horsepower arms race sometimes, but if you look back to the 80s, a lot of cars had less than 100 horsepower. And they really kind of topped out at 200 horsepower. Now, you ne we, we don't really have any cars under 100 horsepower, and it's not uncommon for cars with as many as 400 horsepower to be on the roads. So all, all that means from a practical standpoint as we're planning is that um, cars are more dangerous, potentially the drivers. They can go faster and they're heavier. So I think we as planners, we need to do more with street design um, and with vehicle regulation to help keep them safe. Okay, so I'm, I'm sort of gonna wrap up now and turn it over to Candice, but I like to sort of wrap up with this image. And I, I just wanted to show, and the, the, the point here is I like to show this pedestrian refuge islands as an example of the kind of change that is needed. And I, I think like a lot of people, when they hear my presentation, they wanna hear, okay, well, I spent you know, 20 minutes or a half an hour listening to something about pedestrian safety, which maybe they've never thought about before. So what is like the silver bullet solution? Um, what's the you know, sort of design trick that's gonna solve this is what they wanna know. And I don't think it's that simple unfortunately. But I, I did want to offer this. I think these kind of small scale quality of life interventions are really important. And um, I think there needs to be a shift in the industry. So again, um, this is a pedestrian refuge island. These are not really very sexy. They're not new. Um, they, they're not very expensive. Maybe they only cost a few thousand dollars and they're recommended by the Federal Highway Administration. But I think so. Again, back to that point I tried to make at the beginning, we don't have a lot of people sort of in positions of authority necessarily, especially in our more suburban areas and outside of our major cities that are walking and are experiencing sort of the challenges people who walk or use wheelchairs do on our streets. So I think we need to get more comfortable making more fine grained changes to our streets um, and going back instead of the big projects learning how to go back and evaluate how what we built is working and do um, a better job of listening to the people who live in the communities about sort of what the shortcomings and needs are. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Candice. She's gonna talk about what Maryland is doing um, around infrastructure to address this problem. Good morning. <clears throat> uh, Candice, you need second. to switch your display settings. Go to display settings swap. Go to the display settings swap on your top of your screen. Mm. We're seeing your um, notes mode here. Yeah, the notes screen. There, there you go. Thanks. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm Candice Holford. Um, thank you, Angie, for that presentation. Um, and I just wanted to introduce myself. Um, I am actually, since my regional planning days, I have sort of shifted to a more bike ped focus. So I'm actually no longer the regional planner for Montgomery County, but I do have a statewide focus as the statewide bike ped coordinator. So today, um, I just wanted to give a presentation to update um, everyone on where SHA is addressing ped and bike safety. Uh, last year for Walktober, I 
presented on a couple of our context-driven efforts that um, are related to the context guide. And so we've been doing some work the last year and um, we're gonna really focus on the development of our pedestrian safety action plan um, in this presentation. Uh, next slide. So, um, I'll give an update on where we are in terms of understanding our existing conditions with regards to pet and bike safety. Uh, we'll go over really quickly our context-driven framework um, and discuss all the components that we're working with right now. Uh, quickly touch on the purpose of developing a pedestrian safety action plan and then get to the meat of the presentation, which is our progress, uh, how we're developing our areas of need, and then we'll talk about next steps. So I'll try to do that in about 15 minutes. Um, so before we get to existing conditions, just a reminder of how we're sort of framing it um, in terms of context-driven. Our context-driven framework outlined six different contexts um, by which to evaluate our roadways. And so this really takes into account land use and all the interactions between people and vehicles on the roadway. Um, and by looking at it um, context by context, we can then start to figure out what the best balance is between access and mobility. Uh, so that's kind of the meat of what our context guide does. Um, so in terms of existing conditions and what the data is telling us, um, sorry, one second. So non-motorist traffic fatalities, um, as you heard already, are on the rise. Um, although for the development of the state's pedestrian safety action plan, we're studying the 2016 through 2019 time period, it is worth noting that, the, um, that they continued to rise in 2020 despite the drop in VMT. Uh, so the graphs here show bike ped fatalities versus VMT. As it relates to our context areas, crashes are more likely to be fatal or serious on state highways. The graphs here show non-motorist crash severity by context on state roads versus severity on local roads by context. And then finally, we looked at crash severity by posted speed limit and found that the higher the speed, the more likely a crash would result in a fatal or serious outcome. So that's just some background, you know, in terms of where we stand right now. We did sort of evaluate some other contributing factors and all of that will, will come out in our plan and, and before the final plan will be presented to you iteratively um, at our public meetings. Um, but that I think paints a picture of uh, the sense of urgency. Um, so in terms of our framework uh, for implementing context-driven. Since 2019, when our context guide was first developed, we've kind of worked on a couple of different efforts, um, and we are depicting them in this wheel, a context wheel, if you will. Um, so you'll see number two there has the context guide, which we actually wrapped up um, in as a version one final uh, in uh, fall 2020. Um, and so now that guide is also available online, um, but it's mostly, it's, it's largely the same as the 2019 draft. So what else were we working on? Um, we really found a need to start uh, developing a more comprehensive plan um, to address our needs with regard to pet and bike safety. And so we kicked off the development of our pedestrian safety action plan shortly after wrapping up version one of the guide. Um, that way we could start to think about something a little bit longer term um, while we're, we're also implementing our proactive treatments uh, with our um, existing uh, resources. Um, number three there on the wheel is our context-driven toolkit. Um, in order to implement an action plan and 
even before then come up with some recommendations. We need to understand what tools we have, what our countermeasure world looks like. Um, so we're starting to populate that toolkit and, and understand uh, what that looks like and, and see how we can put that online and make it available for other practitioners. Um, we also recognize the need to start looking at our lessons learned. And so um, we want to uh, figure out a more uh, holistic way to do these case studies that looks at the trends statewide. Um, and uh, at this time, we're starting to get before and after data for some of our corridors um, that we're already uh, allocating resources to to understand how our improvements are um, uh, cutting down those those crash rates. Uh, we also are focusing on education and outreach by continuing to go and meet with our local partners, stakeholders, advocates, um, and also our offices within SHA and MDOT uh, to spread the word, to uh, help our practitioners understand how this fits into the project development process and to provide some resources uh, to the public. And then finally, speaking of resources, we wanted to make it accessible. And so we've developed a web portal um, and I'll have links uh, for all of these at the end of the presentation. Um, so if you think about that wheel that you just saw and kind of what the purpose is of all of those components, that's what this slide shows. Um, our context guide helps us define where we live and where we're driving and where we're riding the bus. It um, help us, helps us define the context. Um, our pedestrian safety action plan will help us start to understand what our needs are, um, document them, and then plan what we're going to do about it. Um, our context-driven tool toolkit will provide the tools for change, and our case studies will show where things are working, where they're not working. And then finally, with our training, we're looking to invest in, in our staff um, and invest in the public who, uh, who are using our roads. Um, we're also looking to uh, make sure that practitioners, our local partners, um, are on the same page as us. Uh, we'd like for our local roads to be just as safe as our, as our state roads, and we want to uh, continue this data sharing relationship that we have with our partners. Um, so what is a pedestrian safety action plan? Uh, PSAP outlines how uh, SHA will improve pet safety. Um, it's going to help us identify the challenges, set some goals, establish our priorities, and apply countermeasures that improve roadway safety. So this is something that um, we haven't really done at, on a statewide basis yet. Um, we're also looking to align with and advance the goals of the strategic highway safety plan, uh, which looks at the four E's, um, enforcement, engineering, education, and EMS. Uh, our plan also employs the context-driven framework to influence the way that we design our roads. Um, you'll see an emphasis on balancing mobility and access based on how the land use interacts with PEDS, bikes, and vehicular traffic. And then finally, the plan will help us prioritize these needs so that they can be programmed uh, as funding becomes available. The goals for the plan are spelled out on this slide. So far, if we were to rank them, most Marylanders surveyed feel that investment should be our number one goal. Um, they're looking for SHA to start programming projects that address our known challenges. Um, but first, we have to understand what those challenges are, and that's what the plan will do. Um, we're also looking, of course, to do a better job coordinating with our partner agencies and see how we can leverage our resources um, to expedite uh, the implementation of these projects. Um, and speaking of expediting, we want to make sure we're delivering all of our projects um, with context-driven objectives. Um, so we're making sure we're wrapping that into the project development process um, and then being innovative in everything that we do. Okay, so now for an update on our progress. Um, 
so as I mentioned before, we've stood up a web portal that went live uh, around this time or later, late last year. Um, and it provides sort of a one-stop shop where you can access anything related to context-driven. Um, on that web portal, you can also find a map that uh, uh, illustrates where we've put down some of our more proactive projects. These are low-cost, high-impact projects, whether it has to do with signage, implementing no right turns on red, um, leading pedestrian intervals, striping some crosswalks so that they're highly visible, um, really those low cost um, but data uh, proven countermeasures. Um, so we have a map that tracks all of that and about 250 to date. The map will show all of those in the next couple of weeks. Um, the last update was in June and we'll have a link for that at the end of the presentation. Um, we've also done some data gathering uh, to understand uh, the picture in terms of crash data between 2016 and 2019, and also other resources and dashboards that other offices at SHA, other transportation business units, and our local partners um, have available. We've held a public meeting um, in the spring uh, and continued that outreach throughout the summer. Um, we had a survey online um, as well as a public comment map. So we've got a good amount of input um, over the course of a month or so uh, to, to crunch. And then um, we've used all our crash data, all the public input, um, all the resources that we had to start doing some needs analysis. So that's what we've done over the last year or so. Um, our statewide progress map kind of shows what we uh, had been working on since early 2019, which is those proactive projects, things that we could kind of get done now that were highly effective. Um, understanding or knowing that we needed to do something more long term and understand what our needs were more comprehensively. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we weren't just sitting on our hands and, and we uh, started to get some improvements on the ground. So these are the 250 or so that you'll see in the next couple of weeks. Um, they'll be on this map that you can find on our context-driven web portal. We also kicked off our outreach and it looks like some text is missing from this slide. Um, but uh, after our public meeting in April, we um, released a comment map for about a month where we could see where are the challenges and opportunities lied. Um, we received about a thousand or so comments on the map. Um, and so we'll be sharing that information at our next public meeting, but we're using that to feed um, our inputs to develop our areas of need. Okay, here it is. Uh, so some of the feedback that we received had to do with crosswalks, um, lack of sidewalk, um, and other deficiencies related to uh, maintenance and the like. In terms of our progress, um, so as I mentioned, we've done our data co collection and analysis. Uh, we have a good understanding of the existing conditions, and now we're working on defining the geographic areas of need. Um, this will be the first step towards prioritizing and eventually identifying actions and strategies in our plan. Areas of need. So um, as I mentioned, we are using all of the public input, all our crash data, um, a variety of, of inputs to develop uh, geographic areas of need. And these are really broad areas that kind of look like blotches on a map um, where we can start to 
pull out um, the highest uh, need for non-motorized improvements. We're looking at public input. Um, we performed an equity analysis. We looked at non-fatal as well as fatal and serious bike ped crashes um, in terms of density, as well as our short trip opportunity areas or STOAs. Um, they'll be selected, the areas of need, by overlaying all of these inputs, and then we'll look at the census blocks to see where they converge most heavily to develop a map um, that looks something like what you're seeing in the background here. And then once we have those blotches, we can start, to, we can develop a process to prioritize corridors within those areas. And then these corridors um, will be the candidates for safety improvements as a part of our prioritization process. Um, so as I mentioned, priority corridors will be selected within the areas of need. Um, we'll be looking at several different factors that are listed here. Um, and then we'll come up with corridors, and those corridors will be our priority corridors where we can start to apply countermeasures um, from our context-driven toolkit. So one example priority corridor that would come up um, is US-1 and Laurel, shown here. You can see lack of sidewalks, um, a number of different concerns related to bike ped safety. We'll be using the results of our public involvement um, as well as additional public involvement that we do this year to understand how, uh, how the public would uh, rank our priority corridors um, to develop our actions and strategies. And that's sort of the final step in terms of recommendations and developing a final plan. So our second round of outreach um, will be later this year. Uh, we're hoping to announce that in the next couple of weeks. So uh, stay tuned for that. That, um, or visit our website for information on that. Okay, and these are the links. Um, the, the presentation will be shared so that uh, you can just click on these links um, to access our web portal, our statewide progress map, or our PSAP website. Um, and if there are any questions, you can reach out to this context guide email that's monitored by several different folks, or you can reach out to me directly. Um, and with that, I think I will hand it off to Sergeant Morehouse to discuss enforcement. Your screen is on, but you need to uh, unmute Sergeant Morehouse. Gotcha. Okay. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. All right, so, you know, this, what we're going to talk about here is, is, again, how law enforcement gets involved with this. And a lot of people think of law enforcement just as, you know, we go out, we write tickets, we lock people up. But our overall realm uh, of, of job duties is public safety, and specifically where I get involved in is traffic safety. So, you know, while there is an enforcement part to this, that negative reinforcement of uh, receiving a citation here and there, uh, that's not our main goal. Our main goal is uh, a lot, most of us would actually rather not have to do our jobs and have everybody be safe and following the rules. So what we're gonna talk about, um, I'm gonna talk about some past practices we used to do with uh, pedestrian enforcement and why they didn't work. Uh, I'm going to describe what we call lead set principles, and and can uh, can Candice actually kind of touch on a little bit of that? What we do uh, used to address the problem. I'll explain what that acronym is. We're the government; we like acronyms. But I'll explain what that means when we get to that slide. Um, and then what we do um, education-wise, as far as uh, before we do our pedestrian enforcement details, uh, how we uh, the, the officers that are going to be involved, how we educate them, what had setting them up, and what to do. And I'll explain what we do on the enforcement side once we get that detail set up. So why are we here? Well, we, um, as both Angie and Cadiz touched on, we're losing pedestrians at an alarming rate. It's almost epidemic levels. Um, and as um, you know, we learned a lot with this recent pandemic where we would assume that there aren't as many people traveling, yet 
uh, fatalities went up, both with vehicle and vehicle and vehicle versus pedestrian. Um, it's a regional problem, so it, it needs a regional approach. Uh, so we actually work uh, in the Baltimore, we're doing things in the Baltimore metro area generally, uh, and uh, which includes, so we're, we're not just training Baltimore County officers, we have officers from agencies all over the state that attend this training, so they can do their own pedestrian details. Um, and I don't want, when we go through this again, I don't want to focus on the type of roadway. Uh, I want to focus more, I want to focus more on the speed. Uh, Kedis mentioned that, you know, state roads tend to be, uh, have, have more fatalities and higher speed equals uh, higher fatality percentage. And that's absolutely true. And it kind of makes a lot of sense if you think about it from a common sense point of view. Um, this comes from a NHTSA guide, the, this table here. And you can see that as far as severe injury, um, a lot of people don't think, may not think that 39, 40 miles an hour is a very fast speed, but we're talking about a 75% chance of a severe injury for that pedestrian. And once you hit 46 miles an hour, it's 90% or more. Um, and as Angie mentioned, you make that, I, I, these don't break down cars and as sedans and SUVs, but an SUV, that's even more because, uh, as she pointed out, we're hitting a, uh, the vehicles are hitting a much more sensitive, crucial to life area by hitting that torso, that chest and torso area. Uh, when you talk about fatal um, injuries, once you hit 42 miles per hour, again, people, a lot of people don't think 40 miles an hour is very fast, but at 42 miles an hour, there's a 50% chance that pedestrian is going to die. Uh, we have a lot of state roads. You're at 35, 40 miles an hour as your speed limit. And who really does the speed limit anymore, right? Um, and as you hit 50 and 58 miles per hour, now we're talking highway speeds, uh, the chance of that pedestrian not surviving increases exponentially. Um, so, you know, what we've learned from the law enforcement point of view, targeted enforcement works if the officers are properly trained. So we're not just throwing officers out there and saying, go to whatever road you want and let's do this detail. We're, uh, we're using information from the Highway Safety Office. We're using information from um, Glenn Sign and his team, Raven team at, at Washington College. And we're looking at the roadways where we have pedestrian problems. We're training the officers to go out there and do the detail. So when we talk about this detail, um, in the past, I can remember 20 years ago, um, about 20 years ago, we would say, hey, this road has a pedestrian problem. We're have, gonna have a pedestrian detail. And we would all go out there untrained and we would basically target the pedestrians. We would catch jaywalkers and we would stop the, jay, uh, the people not crossing at crosswalks and focus on them thinking that was the problem. But um, as we learned through a lot of research coming both out of NHTSA and the Highway Safety Office, that almost 50% of the time, if you look here at this bottom line, um, the driver is at fault. In 2018, it was over 50%, but that uh, five-year average, almost 50% of the time, the driver is at fault. Um, so, and then if you add, uh, if you add the numbers to where, you know, both driver and pedestrian are at fault, there's, there's a well over 50% of the time that the driver has some type of fault, if not total fault in that situation. So we adjusted our details and our training to um, start targeting drivers as well. I didn't say we, I won't say we totally ignore pedestrian error violations, but we learned that we should be targeting these drivers as well. And we adjusted for that. So we looked at this LEETEP, and LEETEP is an acronym that stands for um, leading effective traffic enforcement programs and this is training we do here in Baltimore County as well through the Maryland Highway Safety Office where we take traffic safety leaders in different police agencies and we train them and they're the ones after the training that their agencies will say we have a problem with this traffic situation in this area let's develop a plan of attack to uh, reduce or even get rid of the problem and it looks at the four E's of highway safety that, that Candace mentioned. And that's engineering, and I'll just remind you of them, EMS, education, and enforcement. And for this particular part of the program, I'm only gonna focus on education and enforcement. Uh, the other two obviously important, 
uh, law enforcement is heavily involved in engineering. Uh, whenever, you know, we're out there on the roads every day, we're out there seeing where the crashes are, and we notice while well, we do our reconstructions of these fatal uh, incidents, fatal crashes, you know, we highlight a lot of engineering things. But for today, for my part, I'm going to talk about education and enforcement. Um, not just education of the officers, but education of the violators as well. So the current action strategy, we conduct training of police officers on the best management practices for enforcement of pedestrian safety laws. It's a four-year plan uh, that we're in the middle of. Um, we developed a Baltimore Regional Education Enforcement Effort campaign similar to the Washington Street Spark campaign. Uh, actually, I'll be honest, we stole it. Um, uh, Jeremy Smalley with the Montgomery County Police Department was, was uh, instrumental on their end as far as the enforcement program and training program. And we basically said, hey, that's really good. We're not going to reinvent the wheel. Let's borrow it and we'll adapt it to the Baltimore region. Uh, so, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel. We're using work that's already been out there, time tested, and 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 you'll see that it um, when we get to the results, how well it works. So it starts with education of the officers with our seminar, right? It's only one day of training, which is great because, you know, everybody's short staffed. To, so the, uh, the supervisors out on the road only have to give up their officer for one day of training. It's hosted here at the Baltimore County Police Department's Training Academy by our traffic training team. Um, it's flexible. You know, uh, we don't have to have the best I, the best version is the classroom portion to have a face to face training. But with um, the, the pandemic, we were able to make this virtual and it works very well virtually as well. Um, and it includes resources from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Maryland Highway Safety Office. And it includes a field trip. Uh, it was a virtual field trip in 2020 with the classes we put on virtually, uh, but it includes a trip out to an area where we do this pedestrian detail a lot so the students can see how it's set up and how to set it up safely. Some of the resources, I, uh, this is a uh, pedestrian safety enforcement guide. Uh, is is uh, all the students receive that. They receive these uh, cards here on the detail. So that's part of, that includes part of the education portion of the violators, of the drivers, and, 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 and the pedestrians. So every time we make a stop, whether it's a citation or a warning, we are also um, checking off, handing out these cards and checking off what violation was committed so that uh, the violator understands what the actual rules of the roadway are and, and uh, can learn them and learn to follow them. The flip side of it is in Spanish, and so we can reach our, our uh, reach out to our ever-growing Hispanic community. And then we also have these look alive flyers we give out, just kind of tips for safe driving, safe biking, safe walking. And the reverse side of that is in Spanish. So there's an education factor out there as well. We're not just out there writing people tickets and expect them to go to court. Our main purpose is education to make the roadway safer for both pedestrians and drivers. Um, so this is a part of our detail. We talk about uh, setting it up. Uh, this is an example of a diagram for what would be a 25 mile per hour road. And we use a lot of crash reconstruction science to set up these safe stopping distances because we want our um, everybody involved in this to be safe. Uh, and yeah, there's, we don't want anybody getting hurt. So this safe stopping distance assumes that the uh, driver is 10 miles over the limit. So if it's a 25 mile an hour road, we assume they're doing 35 so that we can increase that safety distance. And it includes a reaction time and a stopping time. Uh, in crash reconstruction, we use an average of 1.6 seconds for reaction time, which is reaction time is the time it takes to say, oh, somebody's crossing the street to the time you put your foot on the brake. Um, but we actually expand that to two seconds, which gives an even more uh, distance. So that 162 feet is based on a um, long, a higher speed and a longer reaction time. So it gives more than enough room uh, for the driver to notice the, the pedestrian and come to a safe stop. 
Uh, we set, you see a cone in the diagram, we set a cone at that distance. Um, and if the car has already passed the cone, the decoy officer does not cross the street. It's just not safe enough to do it. Uh, we have a decoy officer who is always um, wearing bright colored clothing. We have a spotter to recognize which vehicles are creating the violation and tell the sighting officers who needs who, who the violators are, what vehicles need to be pulled over. Um, when we set it up, we always do it during good weather conditions. Uh, no cloudy days, no rainy days, no nighttime details. It's always a daytime detail. Um, and we always make sure it's a nice straight roadway. No hills, no crests, no curves. Um, we want a nice long straightaway, so there's plenty of time. We also make sure there's good signage. So we see here, good bright signage, a well-marked crosswalk. If we get to an area where we're having a problem with uh, pedestrian incidents, we know, we know uh, and we see that we don't have nice good, good signage or crosswalks in that need, a, that need some attention. Uh, that's where the engineering part comes out. We, we make that reference to either county roads or state highways, whoever is in charge of taking care of that roadway. This slide shows what it looks like from the driver's point of view. This is what the driver would see from uh, that point of no return. So you can see that there's, uh, at that where we set up that cone, the signage is still very visible, the crosswalk is still visible, and the person crossing the street um, is still uh, visible. The next couple of pictures kind of show that. Uh, here's a picture uh, of the detail. This um, this person on the detail is obviously properly clothed, a nice, good reflective vest if they're visible. Um, and you can see the cone here, that point of no return, and the car is on the other side of that cone, so it's safe for them to start crossing the street. And I fast forwarded to the end because there's about 10 pictures in between. But you notice the car has come to a complete stop um, at a more than safe distance to allow the pedestrian to safely cross the street. And here's the rest of the class watching how we do the detail. Here's a video of how it works. You see she's bright color clothing. You see the driver doesn't even try to stop, just switches lanes. And there's the enforcement officers waving them over. And this is a parking lot over here. We try to get them off the roadway to make it safe, off into a parking lot where we can engage the driver. Um, and that's a typical of a violation that occurs rather than recognize the pedestrian and come to a safe stop and follow the rules and allow the pedestrian to cross the street. Um, and that's usually typical of what happens with driving violators. Um, now, I'll go back real quick because we often get the question of, well, why isn't that entrapment? Um, and it's because of those safe stopping distances. Uh, on that pedestrian card, as far as pedestrian uh, violations, one of those violations is a pedestrian entering the roadway without giving the vehicle enough time uh, to come to a complete stop. So pedestrians and drivers have responsibilities to keep each other uh, safe and follow, and follow rules. So that safe stopping distance means we're stepping into the roadway with more than enough time, uh, both legally, safely, common sense wise, for the driver to recognize the, the person crossing the street. Uh, we're not just jumping out and saying, hey, gotcha. You know, it's it's more than enough distance um, for the driver to be able to safely recognize the pedestrian and react. When we run the detail, we tell the officers, we make sure that you know, safety is the first priority. If you're in a situation where you're like, yeah, this doesn't look, this guy's coming, in, this car is coming a little too fast. I don't think I'm going to cross the street. Then don't cross the street, right? Um, we make sure the areas have good signage. If they don't have good signage, we write it up. We send it off to whichever road crew is responsible for um, for that roadway. Again, a good line of sight. So we always pick nice, straight, long roadways um, <clears throat> that we're having, uh, especially if it's in, you know, in our high incident areas. We make sure that they have enough room to make the stop. So our enforcement detail teams there's enough area that once they pass that cross, once they've created the cross, uh, the violation and passed that crosswalk, um, our uh, enforcement officers aren't just jumping out at the last minute. There's more than enough room for them to be able to uh, bring the violator to a safe stop and then get them off the roadway to an area where um, 
the encounter and the enforcement encounter can occur. Uh, everyone on the detail should be wearing either traffic safety vests or uh, some bright colored clothing, like you saw the young lady in a bright yellow t-shirt. Uh, again, for visibility and safety reasons. And then we wrap them up and tell them it's as easy as one, two, three. Get your officers trained, select a location based on the data that we have for high, where high incident areas are, and then go out and work the detail. Um, you can do this with as little as three officers, um, but you know you can do as as many officers as you as as you want. Um, I will say that I don't have this slide in this one, but we have in Baltimore County we have three areas that we've been working during this during this plan. We've been doing it for since 2019, and in the areas where we're working the enforcement details, we have had zero pedestrian incidents, no injury crashes, no fatal crashes in the areas we're working the detail. And this isn't enforcement every day. This is this is getting out there once or twice a month. Uh, keeping the maintenance up in the area so that drivers and pedestrians are aware, you know, just to keep it in the back of their head. Is this the day that the police are going to be out here doing pedestrian enforcement? And it's been very, very successful. I said in the areas we've been working, zero pedestrian incidents since 2019. That's my contact information. If anybody has any other questions about these details, where we get our data, how to set them up, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm always here, the cell phone's always on, I'm always available by email as well. And with that, I'll be turning it over to Eli. Yeah, Eli, you'll need to do the display setting swap. How's that? Nope, it's still, if, if you go on that, yep, there you go. Perfect. Great. Um, so I'm going to take this in a bit of a different direction. Uh, my name is Eli Glazier, and as was introduced, um, I am the uh, a multimodal transportation planner coordinator with the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission in Montgomery County. And I am the project manager of the county's pedestrian master plan. And really in that capacity, I'm here to talk about um, this, I think, pretty interesting approach that we've created to understanding and measuring pedestrian comfort um, at the countywide scale. Um, so I'm going to talk about the, how we came up with that approach, what that approach is, and how we've been using it. Uh, first and foremost, um, what what am I talking about here? Uh, the pedestrian level of comfort, um, if you're familiar with bicycle level of traffic stress, um, it's a very similar approach to that. It's really a tool to quantify the comfort of the pedestrian environment. It allows us to score pathways like sidewalks and trails, places without those things where you have to walk in the street and crossings. In this screenshot from our um, mcatlas.org slash ped plan map of the entire county, you can really see the detail in this network where individual intersection crossings are each scored independently. Uh, we have a large county and we have at this point substantially completed scoring every sidewalk, trail, street without a dedicated pedestrian pathway and crossing the county, um, which has been a big task that we've been working on since um, partway through 2019. Uh, why did we do this? Um, the pedestrian level of comfort is really a way for us to move beyond the simple, is there a sidewalk there question of pedestrian connectivity to help us under, uh, part of that recognition is really uh, the understanding that just because there is a sidewalk doesn't mean it's a comfortable pedestrian experience. And just because somebody can walk somewhere does not mean it's comfortable to do so. Um, as as a county and as a planning department, we're really aspiring to do more than the bare minimum here. Um, this also, this approach really provides the same attention to pedestrian analysis that we already provide to bicycling. Um, we use the bicycle level traffic stress approach in our recently adopted bicycle master plan. So this keeps both modes really on the same level. Um, the purpose of PLOC 
is really to um, create a pedestrian environment that's designed for people of all ages and abilities, not just confident adults or those with no other transportation options. The PLOC allows us to really understand disparities in comfortable pedestrian access to local and regional amenities and um, help us achieve our equity goals by doing some scenario planning and helping prioritize future pedestrian improvements. Um, this approach was really developed. Um, early iterations were used in other master plans before the pedestrian plan, plans, um, if you're familiar with Montgomery County, um, in Forest Glen and Montgomery Hills, along our Beers Mill Corridor, and in the Aspen Hill um, area of Montgomery County. After we had our initial approach together, we uh, hired Tool Design, who is a national leader in bicycle pedestrian planning from here in Montgomery County, um, to really make sure we were doing this in the best way possible. Um, I think we are, this is something that really hasn't been done before in the way that we're doing it. Um, and because there was sort of an established approach for measuring bicycle stress, um, we wanted to be confident that the approach we were using was supported by research and that you and used data that was both readily sort of easy, easy enough to collect and available countywide. Um, our approach then was honed in conversations with the community at um, our kickoff meetings for the pedestrian master plan um, through online feedback, our community advisory group, and then conversations with um, our Department of Transportation in Montgomery County the Maryland, uh, in sort of 2019 and 2020. Um, the scoring for this is really, it's broken into four levels, like the bicycle level of traffic stress, pretty simply, um, from very comfortable at the top, so that dark blue circle, in that situation, pathways and crossings are really comfortable for people of all ages and abilities, down to undesirable, which are those places that um, pedestrians should probably only use with the utmost caution if there are no alternate routes or travel options available. Uh, when we're visualizing and trying to really understand the streets and crossings these scores are applied to, we're thinking about how children use the road. So as you get more comfortable as you go from undesirable to uncomfortable to somewhat comfortable to very comfortable, uh, we would expect children to be able to walk more independently. Um, we think of very comfortable um, as the ideal, uh, somewhat comfortable as really adequate, uh, perfectly adequate, um, uncomfortable as room for improvement and undesirable is really just that. It's not something we would build today. It's not something if a private applicant was coming in to construct something we would allow them to build today. And um, for things that do score that poorly in Montgomery County, they're really things that need to be really urgently approved, improved. So here are a couple examples of these different categories. Um, on the left is a suburban example from Germantown of a very comfortable facility. So you have a sidewalk that's a good width separated by um, a wide landscape buffer. Um, and then the street is uh, relatively low speed um, and uh, comfortable. Uh, on the right side is a downtown street in Bethesda. Similarly, you have a wide sidewalk, you have landscaping, you have a row of parked cars uh, block protecting pedestrians in the sidewalk from uh, moving vehicles. Um, somewhat comfortable, which slightly less comfortable on the left um, is a residential street in Wheaton. Um, so a narrow, a narrower sidewalk without a landscape buffer, but it's a low speed street and there's on street parking um, in on Georgia Avenue in downtown Silver Spring. Uh, you have a smaller landscape buffer, a good sized sidewalk, um, and then um, several travel lanes on Georgia Avenue there. Um, getting more uncomfortable, um, Carroll Avenue and Tacoma Park on the left. Um, Pretty narrow buffer, narrow sidewalk. Uh, I believe the speed limit on this two lane road is about 35 miles per hour. So not the best experience. And then similarly in downtown Bethesda, uh, you have a, a pretty wide sidewalk in that urban area, but it's immediately next to high speed traffic um, coming on, on the East West Highway. And then sort of on the, on the worst, the worst of the worst in Montgomery County, I guess, um, Georgia Avenue and Forest Glen on the left. So a narrow sidewalk next to high speed traffic. And then up county in Germantown along Germantown Road, um, you have a similar situation, but with a uh, landscape buffer. And I think what we see for the county as a whole is that 
Um, this is a breakdown of, on the left, the mileage of segments, and then on the right, the number of total crossings um, and broken down by these different comfort levels. And what we see is the majority of pedestrian pathways are either very comfortable or somewhat comfortable. So 58% total. And this really makes sense to us, given that this includes trails and shared use paths. And really the majority of streets in Montgomery County are low speed, low volume, and residential in nature. Um, so more comfortable. Conversely, uh, on the crossing side, you see that most of the crossings in Montgomery County are either uncomfortable or unacceptable. And we think this really speaks directly to the feeling many people have that we've heard of in our conversations that the most challenging element of many pedestrian trips, which I think um, Angie discussed in, in detail, is really just crossing some of these larger streets that divide these relatively high pedestrian comfort islands. Um, and the issue is more the crossings themselves and not walking along streets necessarily. That's just a, a little descriptive statistics. I'll get into the variables that we looked at here. Um, for pathways, uh, we look first um, just as a high level variable at land use, breaking down um, urban pathways in urban areas versus non-urban areas. Uh, urban pathways need to be wider than uh, non-urban pathways, which really is just a proxy for the additional pedestrian demand we would expect in urban areas. Um, next, pathway width is pretty self-explanatory. Buffer width is the width of the landscape or hardscape buffer outside the curb. Uh, we also have a variable for posted speed limit on the adjacent street. Um, and on-street buffer, which is uh, that on-street parking, if there are bull bouts protecting it, um, the presence of one-way or two-way separated bike lanes to further buffer uh, pedestrians from motor vehicle traffic. And then pathway condition is a variable we're still working on, honestly, but when the data are complete, there'll be a three-tier condition classification, good, fair, and poor. If the sidewalk is in good condition, it gets its full score. If it's in fair condition, it loses about a half a point. And if it's poor, if it's a full point worse, which conceivably could bump a somewhat comfortable or like a light blue sidewalk down to uncomfortable, which would be orange. Um, this is really, this is what the scoring matrix looks like for pathways um, where all these different variables are combined. Uh, this I recognize can be a lot to look at, but on the left, going from left to right, you see land use, pathway width, speed limit, and then, um, for different types of buffer widths, different um, types of on-street separation. So uh, par no parking lane, a parking lane, or a one-way separated bike lane, or a two-way separated bike lane and a parking lane, um, just these different combinations. And I think the main takeaway here is that as pathways get wider and a separation from traffic increases, the level of comfort improves. And then as was, as many people on the call have already said, um, all things being equal, as speed increases, comfort decreases. Um, we also have a, spe a special call out for streets without pathways um, in Montgomery County, which is typical of many suburban places. Um, there are neighborhoods, there are communities that were built without sidewalks. And um, in many of them, just due to the characteristics of the streets and of the neighborhoods, um, it can be very comfortable still to walk in the street, so we needed to figure out a way to measure that. So again, looking at land use, posted speed limit, um, this traffic level variable, uh, the functional classification of the street and the presence of on-street parking. What we, the way this worked out in, in general, um, if um, there was, uh, essentially said all, streets without sidewalks or without dedicated pedestrian pathways in urban areas uh, scored a four, so the worst score, that undesirable score. But in non-urban areas, in the more suburban or rural context, it's really a function of what the functional classification is, what the speed limit is, and then if there's on-street parking allowed or not. On the crossing side, uh, we looked at the measure, the type of traffic control, whether it's uncontrolled, uh, cross, uh, stop sign, traffic signals, et cetera, um, the number of lanes you have to cross, the posted speed limit, 
um, what type of median there is, if there's a median refuge, if there's just a concrete median that isn't a median refuge, if it's just paint or if there's nothing, um, crosswalk type from unmarked to standard to high visibility, um, the presence of channelized hot rights, um, and then the traffic level again. And then uh, we also included uh, opportunities for improvement of the crossing score if um, no right turn on red, uh, if there were no right turn on red restrictions, um, if there was lighting, if there's certain traffic calming, if there's a protected pedestrian phase or leading pedestrian interval, um, or if or there's a rectangular rapid flashing beacon um, at an uncontrolled location. Um, these, uh, just candidly, um, a lot of this data has been uh, relatively easy to collect um, through either Google Street View or aerial photography or things like that. Um, some of these um, sort of traffic uh, signalization and traffic timing related things um, have been more challenging and we haven't yet sort of implemented that part of this approach. Um, just quickly going through um, a controlled crossing table. Um, generally, you can see that as either the speed limit increases from left to right or the number of lanes you have to cross increases from top to bottom, uh, the crossing score gets worse. Uh, crossing a lower speed, uh, narrower street is going to be more comfortable than uh, a higher speed, um, wider street. And I think that it sort of backs up and is reinforced by what other folks have said. Um, and then similarly, the uncontrolled um, has the same variables, except everything, all things being equal, scores worse. So I can, if you shift back, if I shift back and forth from controlled to uncontrolled, um, there's a lot more of that red uh, and orange than the dark blue and light blue. Um, we are also working on developing an accessibility overlay for the level of comfort analysis to really help understand us understand those locations that, regardless of how they score in the level of comfort, are not traversable for people with mobility disabilities. And the variables we're looking at are things that are fairly normal in an um, ADA type analysis, pathway width, tripping hazards, the cross slope, if there are obstructions, missing segments, um, if the curb ramps don't have um, a detectable warning surface or the ramp width, slope, landing area, et cetera, is not really in compliance with the ADA. Um, quickly, we can do one um, sort of example of how this works in a pathway context. So on the left, assuming this street is both in an urban area and 30 miles per hour. Um, the purple side of the street on the left, you see as a six foot sidewalk. And on the right, there's a six foot sidewalk, but there's a landscape buffer and the parking lane. And um, if I flip ahead, uh, the sidewalk on the left scores a four, which is uncomfortable because there's no buffer from traffic. Um, and the same with sidewalk, but with um, the landscape buffer and the parking lane, uh, scores a one or very comfortable just because it has that additional separation from traffic. So uh, we have done this and out. We've collected this data for uh, the entire county at this point and have um, obviously we're not scoring these individual segments um, by hand. We've sort of turned these matrices that I've shown you into um, a computer code that just runs this very, very easily. But um, this is sort of a visual representation. Um, and I think the really exciting thing about this, getting beyond just knowing how many miles of sidewalks score comfortable and comfortably in the county is that it allows us to really do network analysis because this network is routable. So that gives us really great opportunities for scenario planning, for looking at comparisons of different um, sidewalk improvements or potential connections to see how comfortable connectivity can be improved and how um, our county's comfortable connectivity can really change over time. So um, this is an example from an earlier version of PLOC we used to understand comfortable park access in the Forest Glen area. So the circled area on the left, um, you see the gray area is a 300 unit condo complex and in our analysis, we found that it did not have park access by comfortable walking routes, even though it was immediately across the street from a park. Um, with the long-term improvement shown on the right, uh, we found that 
um, this location and many others along the corridor became uh, connected to parks, and in many cases, more than one park. Um, this is an example of how making these improvements um, can really help improve the pedestrian experience for a lot of people. And tools like this, this plot tool, give us the opportunity to really quantify just how many people. Uh, we did a similar analysis of pedestrian connectivity to each of the future Purple Line stations in Montgomery County, really looking at conditions at the Purple Line opening uh, to make recommendations to improve comfortable connectivity. Um, we use the network to model trips from all residential units within a half a mile of the station and comfortable connectivity was defined as the percentage of the total distance of all of these trips to the station that scored either that somewhat comfortable or very comfortable level. And what we found is that uh, this is a map from the Tacoma Langley station uh, where uh, you, there's that familiar plot line work where the dark red lines are undesirable, the orange lines are, are somewhat are uncomfortable up through the light blue and the dark blue lines. There are not a lot of dark blue lines in this area if you're familiar with it. Um, what we found is that only 21% of the uh, distance traveled to access the Tacoma Langley Transit Center station would be uh, comfortable uh, at Purple Line opening. And that uh, compared to all the other stations in Montgomery County, that's really near the bottom. So 21% Tacoma Langley, Piney Branch 20%, Woodside 15%. This is compared to uh, Bethesda, Connecticut Avenue, Lindsville, the Silver Spring CBD stations, et cetera. So uh, this tool really allowed us to understand and quantify disparities in comfortable pedestrian access uh, between the different stations in the county. Um, with the goal of making recommendations in the short term, the medium term, and the long term to improve that connectivity. Um, and we were able to make those recommendations and then really quantify the benefits of those improvements um, to comfortable connectivity. Um, another thing we did before I wrap up is we um, were, have been able to use the tool to look at sort of area-wide pedestrian connectivity analysis. This map shows an analysis from the White Flint area with using essentially looking at level of comfort, the level of comfort network, but using a travel demand model to illustrate demand for the various segments along the pedestrian network. Um, thicker lines were used more often and green lines are more comfortable than red lines. Um, this is really just the existing condition, but an analysis like this allows us to potentially prioritize improving those uncomfortable segments that have the most pedestrian demand so we're making the best decisions from a cost benefit perspective. Um, in this case, you can see that uh, Rockville Pike, the north south road in the middle, uh, both has a lot of pedestrian activity and um, is very uncomfortable to walk on. Um, so moving, moving forward, um, in the pedestrian plan, we have started conducting these connectivity analyses to schools, to parks, to libraries, to transit stations in general, to grocery stores. Um, to really understand disparities in comfortable connectivity. And um, I think we're really excited by this tool and the ability to quantify this. And um, I'm happy to, um, I'm gonna kick it back over uh, to Michael to sort of start this facilitated uh, Q&A for all the panelists. So thanks for having me. Great, thanks Eli. And we'll have everybody turn their cameras on now so you can see them during the Q&A. And uh, thanks to everybody who's uh, submitted questions. We've actually received many many excellent questions here and so given the time we might go over a little bit just so we can ask some of these of the um, of the panelists okay um and i'm going to start with one for angie i think from earlier on in the presentation and that is um from jay lambrix who's asking what can we do to reverse this trend and require that new car crash safety ratings reflect their impact on pedestrians Right, we do need a lot more attention to that issue. Like um, we, we have the ability to do a lot with technology in cars. We could be preventing a lot of these deaths with tools that are already available, like automatic pedestrian detection, um, speed governors are gonna be used in Europe, things like DUI ignition um, 
ignition locks in cars. So there's a lot of technology that could be really helpful. And instead we've been going sort of the opposite direction. I do think we need more people engaged in sort of these fights at the federal level. And we do have a new administration in Washington that's a little bit more friendly to, um, you know, regulatory reforms. So in, tw in 2015, the Obama administration had proposed a new rule that would have at least um, rated cars on their impacts to pedestrians, and that was quashed by the Trump administration. But we have seen some of that stuff make its way into the new infrastructure bill that's on the table. So I'm, I'm hopeful um, we can do a better job of sort of elevating that and engaging more regular folks in those kind of struggles. Great, thanks. Angie, I have another question for you here. Uh, what do you say to the suggestion that there are more pedestrian deaths in East Portland or other similar communities because there are more people out walking? So proportionally speaking, is it possible that the rate of collision with pedestrians could actually be the same when you consider the proportion factor? People in East Portland probably are doing more walking, but it doesn't it doesn't account for it. No, there's a, there's an additional there's an additional inequality with the infrastructure that that we can document. Okay, thank you. Um, next question here um, is from Kate Powers, who says. Our city adopted plans to increase housing and commercial and move transit centers to an area that has arterial roads for crosstown traffic and high collision numbers already at intersections. Looking, uh, looking for uh, how city can improve planning for pedestrians and bike safety. What are the pros and cons of Vision Zero programs versus developing a pedestrian safety action plan? Candice, do you want to take that one to start? <laughs> Um, I'm thinking through. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I, in terms of pros and cons, I guess I would first think of it as what are the differences between a more comprehensive Vision Zero plan and a pedestrian safety action plan. Vision Zero is uh, really focused on getting to zero for all traffic incidents, um, whereas a pedestrian safety action plan really is focused on the most vulnerable user. Vision Zero is focused on all users. Um, so the pedestrian safety action plan that we are working on is a, a very discrete, um, it's an action plan. And usually that's the sh shorter time period than say a master plan. Action plans typically are, and folks on this call, I know Eli, you're familiar, might know, uh, action plan is typically around maybe two or three years because you're actually trying to see progress on some benchmarks that you have versus a master plan, which might be like a 20 year plan that's updated um, every so often. So um, for a pedestrian safety action plan for the city, I mean, it's, it's a lot more focused where as a vision zero plan, you can sort of look at a, a bunch of different areas to make some progress in. With SHA specifically, our action plan is focused on infrastructure. Um, if you look at the statewide uh, strategic highway safety plan, right, safety, broad term, um, you're really looking at all users um, and you're looking at all the E's, not just engineering. Um, and anyone else can chime in. No, okay. Well, we'll move on to the next question. Um, this question here says, uh, for planners, what tends to be more effective for pedestrian safety for crossing a multi-lane roadway, a refuge island or a curb bump outs? Do you want to take that one, Angie? If you can, I think both is better. It depends sort of on how wide the road is. I think, um, on a multi-lane road, uh, just a painted crosswalk is sort of not enough, especially if cars are going, if drivers are going pretty fast, the yielding rates can be terrible. There needs to be additional, there's a, there's a, a number of different tools, a refuge island, bump outs, rapid flashing beacons, hawks, it really depends on how wide the road is. But I think we need to, we need more mid-block crossings, I think, A, and just paint on the ground is enough in a lot of situations. 
I agree that I think there's an engineering component there that that would be necessary to make that determination. I'm not an engineer, even though I work for State Highway. So um, I don't feel comfortable speaking on that, but I do agree that the design of the road has a lot to do with it. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question here is from Connor Crimmins, who says, I was asking, how does SHA evaluate requests to reduce posted speed limits on state highways? Previously, the 85th percentile method was used, but this seems to evaluate a posted speed limit based on how vehicles are traveling on them versus the safety and comfort of pedestrians and bicycles, especially for state highways where there are sharrows for bikes and sidewalks right next to the roadway without a green buffer. Okay, so the question is, how does State Highway evaluate requests for uh, speed limit reduction? Correct. Okay. Um, so, yes, uh, you're correct that the um, standard method from an engineering perspective is to sort of look at the 85th percentile um, to see what most drivers are actually doing on the road. Um, <clears throat> but at SHA, especially since the um, development of our context guide, we're looking uh, to incorporate the guide and its principles into all aspects of project development. And so when requests like that come in, we're making sure that when they are submitted to our district offices, uh, specifically our assistant district engineers for traffic, um, that they have all the necessary information to submit that to our Office of Traffic and Safety. So typically it's a design uh, design request and, and some coordination between our district office, who are sort of the local reps for you guys, and our Office of Traffic and Safety. And so we are just looking at 85th percentile and we're working on um, sort of communicating that better through our web pages um, and through our outreach. Um, but we're also looking at the way that the road is being used and understanding that it's changed in the last 50, 60 years um, and that we need to start to um, uh, take that into account, um, not just using our engineering judgment, but bringing in our planners and understanding um, the land use around the area to, to make that evaluation. So you should be able to find um, information about, more information about how we make that determination at roads.maryland.gov. Um, and you could also do a Google search um, for SHA and speed and it should come up. Um, but there's a little more to it than the 85th percentile. And we're working on making sure that everyone understands that um, better over the next few months. Thank you for the question. Great, thank you, Candice. Um, okay, here's a question here for um, Sergeant Morehouse. Uh, about the training program, while understanding that the issue of uh, short staffing for many uh, police departments is one is one day of training enough and effective, and would it be beneficial for there to be more training sessions, especially as scooters are increasing as a form of transportation for many young people? Finally, how has the program worked since it started and to now, and what changes have you noticed? So, so, sort of several questions embedded there. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, as far as effectiveness, I'll start with effectiveness of the program. Uh, the areas where we have put this detail in place, as I mentioned, uh, we've been doing it since 2019. We've had no pedestrian incidents in that area, no personal injury crashes, no fatal crashes. Um, and the area you saw in the video, we started that area because we did have maybe about uh, a quarter of, quarter mile further down the road on that roadway, we had a horrible pedestrian incident with, um, there was a mother, uh, it was a mother, a toddler, and an infant in a car, in a stroller, using the crosswalk appropriately at a light controlled intersection um, that we had a horrible incident occur. And that's that was kind of the impetus to start using that area as well. Um, the actual intersection where the, cr intersection where the crash occurred wasn't a safe place to set up. That's why we moved a little farther down the roadway, um, but in the same general area. So it was very successful that way. Um, and then as we uh, expand uh, in, in looking at our high incident areas, um, in fact, we just recently, within the last month, had three more pedestrian incidents around Baltimore County. Uh, so we're looking at those areas to see if we can set up the detail in that area. As far as the amount of time for the training, uh, it is very successful. Um, 
we talk about, um, I left a few slides out for time interest, but what we cover in that in that one day of training um, is we found is very efficient and very effective. There's really no need to have more than that. Um, and then, um, you know, when it comes to staffing, I, I mentioned staffing generally because a lot of the smaller agencies, like in Baltimore County, we're the only law enforcement agency in, in Baltimore County as far as primary responsibility. We don't have smaller towns that have police departments like Harford County with Bel Air or PG County with La Plata and Riverdale and areas like that. So I mentioned staffing because um, a lot of those smaller agencies, it is possible to do it, um, even though they might only have 10, 15, 20 officers in their agency, you can still get it done. Um, obviously, the more the merrier. Um, you know, if you have three or four violators at the same time, um, you know, and only one enforcement officer, it takes a little longer to to, to get through that that education and enforcement part of the detail. Uh, when you talk about scooters and more scooters and, and stuff, uh, you know, especially some of these motorized scooters, these motorized scooters are becoming very popular with both adults and uh, and and children. Uh, you have to take a look at how they're being used. Um, and so if they're being being used as a without, I'd have to really dig into the transportation article, but as a general rule, if they're being used in adults and they're on the roadway, we'd probably consider them as, as motor vehicles, uh, maybe even more like bicycles. They have a right to be on the roadway, but maybe stay to the side and then give that three foot of, of, of birth when you're passing someone on a motor scooter. Um, as far as children, especially if it's a non-motorized motor scooter, uh, they're still basically a pedestrian. Uh, so, you know, they'll, they they should cross the crosswalks, uh, you know, maybe even get off the scooter and walk it across to be to be safe and stuff like that. Uh, but that's a big challenge. The, the, the use of motor scooters um, is becoming a big challenge for us that we have to address not just from our enforcement point of view, but take a look and see if there's anything that needs to change uh, as far as when the General Assembly is in, state, in session to help us accommodate this new trend. Okay, thank you. This is another follow-up question that we got several for your presentation. Um, this one is from Keith Sorensen who asks, have there been any altercations with drivers when they're pulled over? Not, not, that's led to any um, serious issues. Uh, traffic stops are always an encounter. Um, generally speaking, it's one of the most dangerous things we do in law enforcement because you don't know who you're pulling over. Uh, but we've been very successful. We always you always get one or two drivers that you know they want to they want to have that argument right there at the stop and instead of just getting through the stop and arguing in court. Um, but um, We've been very successful as far as uh, lack of altercations. Again, nothing serious, nothing's amounted to an arrest or assault charges or things like that. Uh, just a general back and forth. But we've been very successful avoiding that altercation because we're coming from an educational point of view. Uh, you know, we're starting with that education. This is the reason why we stopped you, and this is why it's unsafe, and this is what um, the law says as far as the transportation laws in the state of Maryland, and this is why we stopped you. And this is why you're getting a warning or this is why you're getting a citation. So rather than just like the the old days, hey, I stopped you for this and here's your citation and I'll see you in court, buddy. We're not coming from that point of view. We're coming from an educational point of view. We're just trying to make people aware and that helps lower the level and the, uh, the, the possibility for conflict in that traffic stop encounter. Thank you. Okay, next question here is from Eli. Um, how do you work with the SHA on pedestrian environments that are deemed undesirable? Many of these are state road, roads that the county might have limited control over. It's a good question. Um, I think you're right. A lot of the sort of roads that show up as undesirable in our metric are either state highways or some of our larger county roads. And I mean, that's just an ongoing uh, conversation that we have with State Highway and with um, our counterparts at the Montgomery County Department of Transportation about um, our, we have certain in the county, we have a complete streets design guide that sort of is working 
sort of in parallel with the context driven guide that uh, Candice talked about um, to really come to sort of a shared understanding of what we want these roads to look like in Montgomery County and what we want them to feel like. And from a Montgomery County perspective, um, our sort of performance standard moving forward for these roads and for all roads is that somewhat comfortable light blue color. So there's really a lot of work that needs to be done um, to reimagine these spaces, these roads as spaces for people who aren't driving to sort of comfortably move along and move across. And I mean, that's an ongoing conversation. Um, Candice had said that, um, the, I mean, the way our roads were constructed 50 or 60 years ago is not the way that we would, would build them today in Montgomery County, and it's not the way that we need them to, to function today. Um, so that process of retrofitting is going to take a long time, um, and we're working on it, and um, the state highway is working on it, and um, it's just a process. Um, so the metric, the level of comfort metric is, um, it's just one tool to really understand um, where the priorities should be. And then the design process um, sort of has to go from there in sort of identifying funding and um, doing the reimagining and the reconstruction. Okay, thank you. There's another question for you. Uh, kudos to the county's assessment. Moving forward, how would the county prioritize future pedestrian improvements countywide? In addition to uh, considering the PLUX scores, what other factors would the county consider prioritizing future improvements, such as access to schools, parks, shopping, and high crash rates or environmental justice communities? Uh, great question. Um, so the PLUX, PLUX, we haven't really figured out how to pronounce the acronym yet either, is, um, it's really one tool in the pedestrian master plan's approach to the prioritization. So understanding obviously that those more undesirable and comfortable connections should be dealt with before uh, the ones that are already comfortable. Um, using that as one tool, looking at how the different segments and crossings in the county um, allow people to easily and comfortably access schools and parks and all these other sort of community amenities that you mentioned. So prioritizing locations that um, have more demand. Um, in the county, we also have, um, we've done um, sort of a larger equity analysis that's resulted in things called equity focus areas. So looking at whether these segments and crossings fall in those areas um, that um, sort of uh, illustrate and point out the sort of underserved communities that uh, we have in Montgomery County and focusing investment in those areas. And then also, again, like you said, um, sort of these high crash areas as part of the pedestrian plan. Uh, we've done a, crash, a pedestrian crash analysis um, and uh, working on focusing investment to those locations as well. So um, a part of the plan we haven't gotten to yet is really figuring out how to appropriately weight those different variables to determine sort of what those highest priority locations are. And then the goal for us um, is to work with MCDOT to become really more proactive in addressing those um, comfort issues rather than being reactive, which is the way a lot of the um, issues with the pedestrian environment get handled now in Montgomery County. So more of like a squeakiest wheel solution than like a more proactive vision zero focused approach. So we're hoping to provide the data and the prioritization to ensure that those locations that um, are really the highest need um, get uh, improved first. Great, thank you. And again, thanks for all the questions that are being submitted. We're not going to get to them all, but you can see the contact information for our speakers on the screen in case you'd like to contact them uh, directly. But I'm just going to ask a couple more here. I guess this is a more general question I'll direct at uh, Angie and then others want to respond as well. This one is from Ana Hernandez who's asking, what key data points or findings do you find to be most effective to use in convincing non-practitioners about investing in sidewalks or other pedestrian infrastructure? Was that for me? Was that question for me? I guess maybe um, to start, yes. Yeah, one thing I advocate for in my book is I really think um, we need to be doing a better job 
elevating the people who have suffered from these. Like uh, people are, I mean, it's very, we're having a very academic sort of level talk about this, but people's lives are being ruined. I talk to these moms, they lose their only child, for example, you know, who's 12 and they can't even pick themselves up off the floor. I think we need to have more of those people sort of out front doing the advocacy. And, um, and I, I think that that would be helpful politically. Okay. Um, here's another question from Gabby Lawler, who's asking, what is the best strategy long-term to address the pedestrian safety crisis? We have developed numerous strategies to retrofit and revisit roads and, pro and problem areas, but what is a more proactive solution? I'm wondering about changing design guidelines at state departments of transportation. Is that something that is being done in Maryland? And if so, how cooperative have folks been? Do you want to start with that one, Angie? And maybe we'll have Candice respond. I, I can't speak to what's happening in Maryland, but that's something I've been working on with my business, partnered with groups like America Walks and NACTO. We've been pushing for an overhaul of the MUTCD, which is our uh, national engineering manual. And it's it's a very obscure document, but it's it regulates how our streets are designed to a certain extent. And it's full of biases that sort of privilege vehicle throughput and lack of delay for drivers over safety of people who are walking, especially people who might be more vulnerable, like older people. So so we are really hopeful with this new administration in there that they are going to take take this really seriously and make some important changes because you're absolutely right a lot of this a lot of our sort of dangerous practices are institutionalized and it's very difficult to sort of right the ship because for so long, um, the whole goal of all of our transportation agencies was just vehicle throughput and movement and um, it's very difficult to sort of unbuild that. Thank you. I guess here's a question for um, Sergeant Morehouse. Uh, is it possible for representatives from local government Vision Zero task forces to attend one of these training courses? There I am. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, all, our, all of our traffic courses are on our um, website, www.trafficktrainingteam.com. Um, and it's open to anybody in the traffic safety realm. Um, any of our courses are, um, whether you're planners or engineers or anything like that, you're, you're more than welcome to attend the classes. Okay, thank you. I guess we'll uh, make this the last question, just given the time where we are now. And this one was from John Corn, who's asking, I guess, all of the panelists, so Wayne, if, if you want to. Uh, Maryland's new vulnerable road user law went into effect on October 1st. How can we use that as a catalyst to get more drivers to exercise greater care when in the vicinity of people outside of vehicles? Uh, from from my point of view, I, I think you know. I think those four E's are are. You look at those four E's, um, and again, you focus on it. Uh, education that the the new laws out there, whether it's through PSAs or uh, things like that, uh, social media, you know, whatever the highway safety office is putting out to get that message across, and then we'll follow up with with the same idea with with. Uh, if we're having a specific high incident area, we'll follow up with uh, targeted enforcement that combines the education with the enforcement to make people aware of, of the new rules and make sure we're all using the roadway safely. I think this, um, I think it, there's, I think there's a, a larger issue beyond just one piece of legislation that has gone into effect where um, that education component is, I think it, it could be improved. I think one way that we're thinking about doing that or making recommendations to do that is just driver education, education about traffic safety in general, um, working on ways to, um, when you renew your driver's license or um, have to do certain sort of administrative things for your car, like 
providing opportunities to um, retest or like make make it harder to drive than it is today, basically. Um, I think so many people, when they got their driver's license, could be 40 years ago, 50 years ago, what have you. And the environment that we move around in has changed and the laws have changed. And there's um, there isn't a great way to sort of universally update folks on what laws have changed. Um, so I think uh, Targeted education and enforcement is super great, but um, I think we really need to figure out a way to really institutionalize, making it easier for folks to understand um, and be responsible for um, changes in the environment. So like hawk signals and RFBs and things like that, and then also legislation uh, like this as well. Great, thank you. Um, I think, Candice, you wanted to add a little bit more to what you were uh, responding to on the Vision Zero question. Oh, yeah. Um, I think Angie provided a good response. Are you, are you able to just repeat the question since it was a question or two ago? Just for the, for the group, John. Uh, let me see if I can find it. There was a quite a volume here. I tell you what, we'll we'll follow up with the the question directly oh, okay. with you. I can summarize it really quick. So the question I think was just more so about what is the state doing um, to to implement Vision Zero? Do we need a policy change or anything like that? Uh, so I just wanted to outline really quick what many probably already know, but in 2019, we finally had a piece of legislation um, that was enacted to make vision, Maryland a Vision Zero state. So uh, we had been um, addressing Vision Zero related issues th through our Towards Zero Death um, effort, um, but now as a Vision Zero state, we're required to do a number of things. Um, so now we have a Vision Zero coordinator and that person is uh, Tim Kearns um, in our Highway Safety Office. Um, but as it relates to State Highway, we, um, we're taking that and running with it. We now want to make sure we have our own Vision Zero plan. So we were talking before about the differences between a pedestrian safety action plan and a Vision Zero plan. The pedestrian safety action plan is a little shorter time span. We're trying to see progress. But with this Vision Zero action plan that we're working on, it's much larger umbrella. And so that's also a parallel effort that's going on um, that I'm working with um, a, a good cross section of the agency to kind of come up with a five year plan um, that addresses Vision Zero, a, a larger umbrella than just context driven. So we have a coordinator. Um, we have a framework to, to now start making progress. Um, and as a part of our Vision Zero work at SHA, we're looking at all of our policy documents and manuals. The MUTCD itself is, is already um, has gone out for comment and we've waited on that. So there is definitely some movement um, that was triggered, I think, by the legislation. Um, and if we're talking about catalysts with the vulnerable road user bill, um, I really think the catalyst came before that bill. So legislation helps. Um, it helps uh, honestly get things funded as well um, in an ideal situation. But um, the catalyst came long before these pieces of legislation. So. Um, I'm happy to, to provide additional information on what SHA is doing, um, but I think that as a state, um, we really are headed in the right direction when it comes to Vision Zero. Great, thank you, Candy. Thanks to everybody for uh, staying on here longer. Um, this has actually been the most popular of our Walktober walk in our uh, program. So there's a lot of interest in this area and we'll have some conversations with the team about possibly having some follow-up on this topic area. So with that, we're gonna conclude our webinar today, Pedestrian Safety Trends, Measures and Solutions. Uh, I'd like to offer, <clears throat> excuse me, a great big thank you to our speakers for a great presentation, to everyone who attended today, and to Francine Waters and Brittany Brothers of MDOT, who uh, pulled the series together, as well as to John Coleman, our communications and technology guru, who managed the technical aspects of the program today. The complete recording of today's webinar will be posted online, and our, partic our participants will be sent an email with the link.
When you exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide feedback so that we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. Finally, please uh, join us next week for the final Walktober walk on our great partners and creative approaches to, for promoting safe walk opportunities next Thursday at 10.30 a.m. Eastern. Visit smartgrowth.org for more information about these programs and to view our webinar archive, which includes recordings of past programming programs include the uh, including the other Walktober Walkinar programs this year and last year as well. With that, we wish you all a great day.